hi everyone for those that don't know me, my name is Garrett Bruhog. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Rochester. I work at the Laboratory for Laser Energetics, so mostly what I'm working on is things involving fusion, but my undergrad was at Idaho State University. I did, uh, you know, that's a fission facility. I was a fission reactor operator, and I'm going to talk to you guys about nuclear aircraft, which if you know anything about Idaho, is where a lot of that work happened, and I actually was taught by one of the guys that worked on this project, was a lead engineer for it, so a little bit of weird stories bouncing around my head from him. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll dive into nuclear aircraft, uh, the history of it, um, what, what all has been done, and we'll talk about uh, potential future. Um, so just a quick summary of what I'm going to go over. We'll talk about what a nuclear aircraft is, what work was done, and then, like I said, we'll talk about should we bring the concept back? Is there anything else uh, worth diving into? Uh, so to start out, what is a nuclear aircraft? Um, it is an aircraft that uses a reactor for propulsive uses. So, and, and I'm going to talk almost entirely about reactor-based propulsion. There is also radioisotope-based propulsion concepts. We'll touch on that for like a second at the end. Um, it's a little different and radioisotopes have a scale, a size scale issue. It's just hard to make a lot of isotopes, but there was some look into that. And, and this talk won't cover everything that was ever done. It's hard to find information on, say, like Soviet programs. And as you dive into the history of the Cold War, I'm sure I'm missing something. I'm sure the CIA had something or some other project that I wasn't able to find. But this is this is the, the big pieces that made it very far is what we're going to go over. Um, having said all of that, these are typically jet engines. There were propeller planes also investigated, turboprops, and of course, famously, nuclear rockets as well. Um, and every every variation therein of has been considered. There's a number of advantages for nuclear aircraft. They have no carbon emissions. Um, if they're well designed, they have no emissions at all, just hot air. Uh, they have incredible range, days to months of flight time, and they have an ease of supersonic flight. Um, supersonic aircraft using chemical combustion use a lot of fuel. So if you consider like the Concorde, the Concorde was just this fuel hungry monster. It couldn't even make it across the Pacific because of the requirements of supersonic flight. And as you go faster and faster, there's a cons um, there's flame limits with supersonic flight. It's very, very difficult to keep your fire lit propelling your jet aircraft. Uh, when it comes to a nuclear reactor, it does not care. There is no speed of air that will ever blow out the nuclear reaction. So you can, you know, it, it comes down to how fast can you make your airplane go? Um, there are size and safety limits though. Uh, nuclear likes to be big. It works better the bigger you make it. So that um, when you're thinking about these aircraft, I'll show you some pictures of things that were considered, but have in your mind things that are like 747s, not F-16s and Cessnas. So there are two distinct types of nuclear aircraft propulsion. We have direct cycle nuclear propulsion. So that's where the air flows directly through the reactor core and is heated up by the fuel elements themselves, just like water is in a PWR. This provides the best power density and it's the simplest engine to make. It's very straightforward. Uh, there's, of course, risks of nuclear fuel leakage and fission fragment leakage, air activation, and direct radiation risks, because we can't shield everywhere around the core if the core is part of the jet. If you imagine a jet engine in your mind, there's kind of two areas where you couldn't have shielding because you have to have the air flow in and the air flow out. Um, so there's what we would call in the nuclear biz uh, line of sight um, issues there. But it can be worked around. It, it has been worked around, I should say. Um, and air, air doesn't, air does activate. It doesn't stay activated for very long. We're talking about maybe minutes for like nitrogen and oxygen isotopes. Um, dust may be a problem, but you don't typically want have want to have dust in your jet engines, anyways. Uh, but direct fuel leakage is the real big concern with direct um, nuclear propulsion. You know, fission fragments wiggle their way out of fuel pellets, and you don't want those going out in your exhaust. And this picture to the right, this is not a drawing. This is an actual picture of a real nuclear jet engine direct cycle that was made. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but that's that's the real deal. Uh, indirect cycle nuclear propulsion is where we have the reactor and then we use a heat exchanger to get the heat towards the to the jet engine or turboprop or whatever. Um, liquid metal, molten salts, helium were all considered. There's probably others I'm missing. Uh, this is a more complex and heavy engine, but is, of course, much safer. We can fully shield all the way around the reactor, so you can turn the reactor on at full power and have people walking around everywhere around the engine with no risks that are, uh, the risks are no different than any other typical jet engine. Uh, right here is a picture of one. You can get a, or at least you used to be able to get a poster from the Generation Atomic website. I actually have one on my wall 
hold it down. But yeah, it's a really cool design. <laughs> um, so moving on from that, nuclear aircraft have been considered since at least 1948. There's probably earlier discussions in the Manhattan Project. They just weren't written down. Uh, but the first UASF studies began that year. And that's also when the Air, I believe it's when the Air Force was started. Um, the goal was nuclear-powered, nuclear-armed bombers to fly deterrent patrols against the Soviet Union. You'll note this was also the year the Soviet Union uh, got nuclear weapons. Uh, aircraft like this could stay aloft for weeks or months and carry huge payloads. Um, if you know the history of nuclear weapons, they were very, very big initially, and so it was difficult to make aircraft that could even carry them. And so nuclear propulsion looked like a natural fit for this. Uh, it was also difficult to get aircraft all the way there and back. The B-36 was the first bomber ever made that could do those sorts of flights, and it's to this day one of the largest bombers ever made and had a lot of problems. Um, so there was a, the, the interest made a lot of sense initially. And from this, there were three major programs that started and began testing and constructing real nuclear aircraft engines. We had a direct cycle nuclear bomber project for near-term use. The idea was deployment in like the 1960s-ish. Uh, an indirect cycle nuclear bomber project for longer term R&D. This was seen as definitely the path for the future. Um, the, si the safety wasn't necessarily the biggest concern. There's, there's also some um, operational advantages of indirect cycle that we'll talk about. But the even the military would like safer operations uh, for, their, for their guys. They don't want to throw fission fragments down on um, the populace that is not the enemy. So there's a lot of reasons for that. And then there was the direct, nucle direct cycle nuclear cruise missile led by the then brand new Lawrence Livermore National Labs. This was kind of one of their big projects. Um, it is a different beast entirely, and we'll, we'll hit that one as well, but it's a very notable project. So the direct cycle nuclear bomber uh, was a fully functional engine create, that was created. You can see it at, EB, at the EBR-1 Museum in Idaho. These are the pieces from it. Uh, the project was canceled in 1961 but achieved all goals required to move on to a flying prototype. Everything was ready to go. It was the first engine ever started on nuclear heat. A lot of nuclear um, engine tests were done where they would have chemical uh, heat get everything going and then go to nuclear. They actually fired this reactor all the way up, just like you would a normal jet engine, but this time you're pulling control rods rather than moving fuel. Um, the reactor was called the HTRE3 or high, I believe it's high temperature, reactor three or something like that. Um, it's the picture shown here. I want to check the chat. Uh, it was a direct cycle nuclear engine. Like I said, it used UO2. So just like we normally use in our reactors today, but uh, highly enriched fuel to get um, high power densities. It was ran for hours at really high temps. So greater than 1100 C, which is really hot, but typically operated much cooler than that. So as to not the, melt the rest of the jet turbine. A uh, humorous story I was told by my professor who worked on this was that uh, one of the guys who brought them uh, turbines, I believe it was from Boeing, came out with these brand new super fancy turbines that were supposed to be the best ever. And it was very dismissive of their work on this weird nuclear thing. Who cares about that? You know, it's all about the jets that we're making at Boeing. And um, they uh, melted part of the turbine with the reactor heat and packaged it up nicely and sent it back to him with a note that said, try again. Uh, <laughs> the reactor did have a minor core melt though, due to a faulty sensor. Um, it's, a, it's a rather famous uh, it, um, problem in the, uh, or rather famous accident that happened in the nuclear community. It wasn't a big deal. No one got hurt. They cleaned it all up. And it taught us about how to better make um, reactors that are uh, relying on computer control, or at that time, I think it was vacuum tube control. The next step was to make the XMA-1 engine. Uh, this was going to build right off everything that they learned. It was designed for a conveyor bomber meant to fly for greater than 40 hours at Mach 0.9, so very, very close to the speed of sound, circling around the Soviet Union, and then use chemical boosted afterburners to go up to Mach 2.5, sprint in, and, you know, end the world. Uh, they were switch they were talking about switching to metal fuel for this engine due to poor experiences with the UO2. They wanted better heat transfer. And this is a, a mo model of what the engine would look like. The bomber was to have, I think, two pods of these two engines on each side, on each wing, and kind of you can just barely see it in the sketch here. But if you look up those conveyor bombers, they're this really interesting flying wing sort of uh design. They they thought they could easily build. Wow. So 
the indirect cycle engine project was a molten salt reactor. It's the famous ARE that we, if, if you're into molten salts, you've heard of the ARE project. Um, the need for a very light, very power dense reactor for aircraft is what kicked us all off. And this is a picture of the ARE. It's a beryllium reflected fluoride salt. Uh, I believe it was using highly enriched fuels. And that's definitely what was going to happen in the, uh, in the aircraft because you need that power density. Uh, they ran up to 760 C. They wanted to operate over 1000 C. If you remember the thousand ish temperatures from before, this is more than enough to run your jet engines. Um, the real trick was going to be the heat extraction. Uh, they were going to do that via enriched liquid lithium heat exchangers. Uh, lithium is the lightest metal. So it would be the absolute lightest way to move the heat outside of helium, but lithium you can move with little to no pressure. So you don't need a stick of walls. And they had to use enriched lithium because uh, lithium six gobbles up neutrons. Uh, you, I believe you also use enriched lithium in the fluoride salts in these types of MSRs. Uh, the future flying designs were expected to be Mach 3 capable because this was such an incredibly power dense uh, reactor. And I don't mean like chemical boost and sprint. I mean, the plane would get up and cruise at Mach 3, uh, similar to the famous XB-70 Valkyrie bomber, but rather than um, consuming, you know, unbelievable amounts of kerosene per second, it would get up and fly around for days at Mach 3. Uh, the specific power with the shielding, which is a very important number here, was going to be greater than eight kilowatts per kilogram. And that is a incredibly power dense system. Uh, it was going to power six engines and sustain this massive bomber, similar to that flying wing conveyor design, um, once again, for military applications. There was also a reactor flown just to test basic nuclear flight operations. This is the airplane with a reactor in it. This picture was taken with the reactor on. Uh, you'll notice it's not glowing green or anything fun like that. It was a very simple water-cooled reactor installed in the back of a B-36 bomber just to test some of the shield designs and nuclear operations. It was basically a trigga. Um, they found a lot of issues, but the program was canceled before they could really address any of it. It was, it, it was your typical stuff of when you're first testing things, you find problems. And all of these nuclear aircraft projects were canceled at roughly the same time due to a lack of need. Uh, ICBMs were better at the job. Um, you know, the, these machines are large. They need lots of crew. They need all this help um, or all, all these different operations to keep them running. And they're easier to shoot down because they're an airplane. ICBMs sit in a silo. You pay a bunch of people to sit there and stare at a wall and hope they never get a call on a red phone. It's a lot easier system to work on, and they're nearly impossible to shoot down. Um, and, and this was known even back when these projects were going. I remember asking my professor, Dr. Jay Coons, about this. Um, and he said even, even when they were working on it, they wondered what was the point, what, if, if this really made any sense to make these bombers. Um, the final project was the infamous Project Pluto, a nuclear cruise missile. This was a Mach 3 direct nuclear engine missile that flew at treetop level, delivered 10 to 20 thermonuclear weapons. So we, it's almost more like a drone than a cruise missile. Uh, it would kill with direct radiation from the unshielded reactor, completely unshielded. The whole thing was unshielded. And it was going to fly so low that if it flew over you, the radiation from the reactor would kill you. It was going to leak fission fragments at a truly prodigious rate out the back. Uh, I tried to calculate this. It's a little hard to get exact numbers, but it was something along the lines of um, Chernobyl every like three seconds. Um, and it was going to also have a really nasty sonic blast wave from being Mach 3 at treetop level, which would also kill people. And then, of course, the 10 to 20 thermonuclear warheads. It was a terrifying machine. This was... Uh, thought up by Lawrence Livermore National Labs in their bid to prove uh, that they were the scariest national lab out there. And you'll notice this really odd shape. The point of that was that it was going to only be flying at Mach 3. It would get rocket boosted up to speed. And then this is, I think it's called a wave rider shape. It only flies really fast. Um, well, and because of the incredible uh, power density provided by this nuclear engine we'll talk about in a second, the uh, missile was actually going to be made of steel rather than, say, alum you know, aircraft-grade aluminum or something, and that allowed them to handle the heat of constant Mach 3 flight. Uh, and that's where another nickname you'll hear it referred to is the flying crowbar. 
because it was just going to be a big chunk of cast steel with a nuclear reactor in the back and a bunch of nuclear bombs in the front. Oh, uh, the project reached all engine goals and was set for a test flight. This is a picture of the final test engine, Tori 2C. Um, this is a picture down into the core. It was a 461 megawatt thermal engine. And look at how little it is. You know, you look at that person and this was making 461 megawatts. And most of this is not reactor. Most of this is engine. Uh, it ran at 1300 C with Mach 3 air conditions, no fuel damage, performed amazingly well. They have this huge long um, series of pipes, like hundreds of miles of pipes that they had set up to be able to push air through in Mach 3 conditions and test it on the ground. Uh, the reactor was a truly incredible design. It was homogenous beryllium uranium mixed together and then extruded like Play-Doh to make this very high surface area, very tough um, homogenous thermal reactor that they were really interested in how they could use the least amount of uranium in it. Uh, fuel leakage was of course a massive problem though. Uh, about 0.2% of fission fragments were coming out. And it was found to be due to the uranium on the surface, throwing fission fragments directly into the air. They had no clad on the fuel. Nothing was stopping the fission fragments. So some, not very much, but some of the heating in the engine was direct fission fragment heating of the air, which is a interesting problem to have, to say the least. How do they measure that? The Roughly 0.2%, is that like per per minute, per hour, per... 0.2% is... of all fission fragments. As you turn them on, they just leak out directly. That was direct leakage. There was also indirect leakage from thermal push. Um, as, the, as the fission fragments deposit in the, in the fuel, they'll diffuse out from the temperature. Um, they did not measure this very well. They estimated, this was all tested in Nevada. And there was estimates made based on um, air samples done several minutes later, but it was very difficult to do any direct testing because the air coming out of the back of this thing was not friendly to detectors, mm -hmm. <laughs> nor would being near it be friendly to anything. Uh, the project was canceled before the first test flight could occur, but they were ready. Everything was basically built, and it just needed to be bolted together and given permission to fly. They were going to launch this from San Diego and let it fly around in the Pacific for a while and then just nosedive into the Pacific Ocean, and that was going to be disposal. Um, real awesome plan there. Uh, the U.S. military actually canceled the project. They pushed for the cancellation. It was considered far too provocative for deployment. Uh, they, uh, some people high up in the military realized that deploying this was going to lead towards what's called an escalation chain very quickly with the Soviet Union. And there was also worries about what the Soviet version was going to look like. If we were going to have missiles circling them, well, wouldn't they have missiles circling us? Uh, and then once again, ICBMs were also considered more effective for the job and cheaper and less evil, uh, if that's believable. Um, the basic design, though, it's really innovative. The core is incredible. Everything about it's incredible. And it's been considered for probes to Jupiter. There's There's been talk of having what's effectively a Project Pluto sent to Jupiter and then fly around the entire planet, uh, which would, I, I think that would be a great mission to do. We could go and explore those incredible clouds and storms. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing was dead for about 10 years. And then the oil crisis happened. And nuclear aircraft kind of resurged in at least academic considerations. Now, this wasn't the military considering it. These were NASA-funded projects. Uh, they were looking at how could we move lots of goods and how could we fly without consuming all the oil that we needed. Uh, they, the two big ones looked at were cargo hovercraft and huge cargo aircraft because of the scalings of nuclear. And... The, the conclusions of the studies were actually, it looked very favorable for shipping goods, even compared to cargo ships due to the high price of oil at the time. Uh, I don't know how it shakes out now, but it was it's definitely an interesting idea, shipping massive amounts of goods at really high speeds. Even these hovercraft would be doing something like 100 miles an hour across the ocean. And notice the size is 5,000 tons. Um, these are big, big, big vehicles. But the nice part is they can haul a lot more cargo than an equivalent-sized um, chemical-powered vehicle. Uh, the focus was entirely on indirect cycle engines because this was civilian. 
uh, mostly on subsonic designs. There wasn't much interest in going supersonic, uh, primarily because all the issues noted with large supersonic flight being very annoying for people. Um, you wouldn't like it if a plane that big came in at Mach 3 over your city. It would probably break all your windows. And it would suck if that was a regular occurrence. The shielding designs were so thick that you could sleep on the reactor all year while it was on and only get 0.2 rem. So you don't even get, you know, if you're a if you're a nuclear operator, that's nothing that doesn't get you anywhere near your legal limits. And that's you sleeping on the reactor. Take two steps to the front of the um, of the plane and it lowers even more. Uh, and the reactors were all using solid cores, but there was some interest in MSRs down the line. I think they were just looking to use what could be developed immediately. And the reactor designs are very similar to the Kairos reactor, if anything. Um, it was this kind of UO2 pebble bed, uh, and then they would have molten salts or liquid metals move the uh, heat to the um, jet engine. Uh, a big takeaway from this was not just papers, but they did fuel failure testing and even crash testing. So the idea was in the event of a crash of the aircraft, the shielding itself would act as armor for the reactor, so it wouldn't spread stuff everywhere. Um, and there were subscale tests done with these reactors, which are still pretty big. I mean, you can see this picture and you can see kind of a car here and a car here. It's a pretty big thing. Um, it's maybe a third or fourth of the size of the final reactor. Um, where they launched them at greater than 120 meters per second with rocket sleds into various targets, and these were pulled down to vacuum so they could tell if it leaked by checking to see if any air got in. Uh, nothing, no, no leaks at all, and there was even a failure of the backstop. You can see all this like steel and different stuff that was in the way. Uh, at one point, there was something wrong, and it failed, and one of these balls went bouncing down the road and crushed a car, and they still found no problems. Uh, so it's it's pretty incredible. And there was also fuel failure tests done at things like TREAT and ATR to determine if their fuel plan was going to survive all the potential excursions, um, especially because a nuclear aircraft is going to go up and down in power quite a bit. So you need to be able to handle that. These studies also showed us how important power density is. Uh, there's this nice equation uh, that I re-derived from the paper, and I have some plots here. But it comes down to as the power density of the core increases, so you're getting more megawatts per um, cubic foot, the area we need to cover with the shielding is lower. And so we don't have as heavy of a reactor. And that's what really is important for mobile reactors is power density, power density, power density. In this plot, I have, say, like a normal pressurized water reactor here. You can see it's really, really heavy very fast with the um, amount of shielding. And then as we increase in power density down to say like the Project Pluto reactor down here, the amount of shielding even at very high powers gets much more reasonable. This is still you know hundreds of metric tons, but these are hundreds of megawatts thermal, which are equivalent to large aircraft. And this is assuming four pi, really um, serious shielding and arguably not super optimized. Didn't talk about this much, but a lot of these shielding designs were, um, they relied a lot on water and depleted uranium which has got its own problems in terms of mass. If you look at some of the NASA studies on how to do shielding for nuclear propulsion, where mass is the most important thing when you're flying uh, to space, there are better ways to do this shielding. And I think a, a more modern take could probably come up, could probably cut this number by at least a bit. Uh, there's also nuclear aircraft that will soon fly on Titan, a moon of Saturn. So this is using an RTG rather than a reactor, but this is funded. They have begun building it. It's called Dragonfly. It's very, very exciting. It'll launch in 2026 and fly in 2034 on uh, Titan. And it's much easier to fly on Titan because of lower gravity and denser atmosphere. So something using plutonium RTGs and flying as a helicopter makes quite a bit of sense. Uh, the power density of an RTG isn't super great, but... Uh, Titan has got such a thick atmosphere and low gravity, you could flap your arms with, you know, like wings like Icarus bolted on and actually take off. So what can we take away from all of this? Nuclear aircraft engines can be made to work and have many potential advantages. There's no emissions, ease of supersonic flight, low fuel costs per unit energy, even at high enrichments. As, as we all know, nuclear has got a lot of advantages there and fuel cost really drives aircraft cost. Uh, but nuclear aircraft need to be carefully designed to be safe. We can do it, but we have to really think it through. Indirect cycle seems to be the only way to do it, and we have to be sure to seal the fuel and armor the reactor. Applications for nuclear aircraft need to emphasize their advantages. Um, we need to think about massive scale, high speeds, long flight times. That doesn't work for everything. No nuclear F-16s. 
but you know, maybe nuclear 747s. Uh, what do you all think? That's awesome. I have a million questions. <laughs> Fire away. But uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll do one, but I want to give other people a chance to. Um, so why, why isn't this ever talked about? Like, I, I just assumed a nuclear power aircraft was not even really feasible. I just figured they couldn't get the amount of propulsion that they need. They didn't have much enough torque in the engine to, to create enough blast to lift off an aircraft. But so I'm already impressed that that's even a possibility. And, uh, but it's like, why? So if this is a thing, it's like, why? how come nobody's talking about it for a commercial use? Because obviously that's like one of our biggest challenges, how are we gonna decarbonize our aviation fleet? So I think it's a couple of things there. The nuclear aircraft projects are very old and there's a lot of really wild, cool ideas from way back in the beginning of the nuclear age that um, just don't get talked about or they get completely reinvented. You see this with a lot of these new reactor companies claiming they've invented a new type of, you know, a new way of doing things. And, and Nick Turin is great about this. You just read through the history and you can usually find their idea. Um, so this, it's just old. It's not necessarily well known. It's really connected with military use, which people, you know, makes people nervous. But there's also limited application. You're, you're, it's a big, you know, getting into aviation is big, getting into nuclear is big. Now you have two big steps. And you're only going to be playing in the range of making huge aircraft. So I think you would need, you would need like a national project. I don't, I don't think a company could pull this off themselves, but if a, if a country said this is what they were going to do, then they could do it. Oh. <laughs> Who else has questions? I don't want to take them all or all the time on my questions. I got one. Uh, so Garrett, uh, hypothesize for me a little bit about a like floating sky hotel or, you know, like a sky aircraft carrier type of thing that we've seen in the Avengers movie movies possible and maybe potentially more practical than uh, an airplane, um, something that maybe moves a little bit slower. Um, oh, like a Zeppelin? Goals. Yeah, yeah, something maybe. Yeah, so I didn't, like I said, I didn't cover all the nuclear aircraft designs that have been mentioned. Nuclear aircraft were also looked, or nuclear zeppelins were looked into, nuclear seaplanes. Uh, Lockheed Martin even had a nuclear aircraft carrier design where it would launch F-16s out the back. Wow. Um, there's a lot of potential there. And I think if there was a want to do it, you could make some truly stunning and monstrous um, aircraft this way because uh, it, it gets it gets to be nearly impossible for chemical fuels to keep up with that. Whereas, new, as we all know, nuclear scales great. So if you want to make something, um, it, some of those NASA papers are really fun to read on that because they look at a thousand ton aircraft and a five thousand ton aircraft, and the five thousand ton aircraft for nuclear just looks stunning. I mean, it starts getting wow. really competitive with like cargo ship and train prices <laughs> um, just because nuclear likes to be big. How about for tourism? Like, uh, you know, floating like sky hotel. <laughs> I get the money and the NRC approval and we'll, we'll build it and fly. <laughs> that, 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 that was a video that was making the rounds earlier this spring was this uh, concept of the sky hotel is, you know, a big long, YouTube video on it and so <laughs> yeah uh, it looked like there was another question oh uh, yeah Jerry hand. had his hand raised oh yeah uh good evening uh it's evening here but I think it should be afternoon over there so I was like I'm trying to ask thank you for the great presentation um there is this new move to making um aircraft powered by solar so uh, if you want to bring these two tech together side by side, because we are like uh, propounding the nuclear and renewable solution to climate and, and all that goes with it. Uh, right now, the nuclear um, powered um, aircraft seems to be a military program. 
but the solar powered one doesn't seem to be so. Uh, I wonder if there is any parallel between these two technology that can be brought to the commercial front, kind of um, bringing it to the commercial, just like you, um, Eric just asked about the like uh, the floating hotel or something like that, like bringing it to the commercial front of like maybe getting to take passengers or something like that from point A to B and vis-a-vis uh, -vis the climate um, concerns and all that. I was like wondering if, if there is any kind of um, projection of when this thing will get uh, uh, commercialized for maybe to go off of the military uh, restrictions or bounds, if I may say. Yeah, so there is no current mil US military nuclear aircraft project. There is a Russian nuclear missile project that seems to be doing something. I don't I can't comment on that. I don't know enough. Um, but there is no US military project on. It. There actually are US military solar powered drones um because the lifetime is nice for that. Uh if there was interest in commercial nuclear aircraft there was real serious interest with you know the large funding needed i don't think there's any particular barrier it's just going to be very challenging to to as with all nuclear things jump the regulatory barriers and and we don't have the advantage of just being able to plug in say a pwr so we are going to actually have to do some really serious reactor r and d um, I would, if there, if interest started tomorrow, I would say it would take like 10 years before something flew. Um, but it would have to be real interest. I would have to see like Joe Biden get on TV and say he wants to make nuclear aircraft before I believe something happens. Um, yeah, uh, I, I guess, Charlene. Uh, thanks for your presentation, Garrett. Very, very interesting. Um, my question is, um, do you know what the defense in depth case was for the um, the aircraft that had a similar to design to the Kairos Hermes reactor? Outside um, of outside of the fact that they were using uh, a pebble bed or yeah, so to... so that that was actually not a defense design. That was a NASA civilian design. Um, the it's it's related to the to the defense design, which was a pure molten salt reactor. Uh, NASA felt that it was not, that was not a mature enough technology and walked it back. I believe in a similar argument to why Kairos is, is going the way they are. The defense argument for those reactors was to be very similar to a, a nuclear submarine. It was to be the follow-up in case of a nuclear strike on the United States uh, because the aircraft would be Mach 3 capable and it would circle for days and it would be very, very hard to find and uh, track down and it could come in and release um, a, a nuclear payload on target uh, as a follow-up for, for MAD-based deterrence. Okay, so there's nothing there that that uh, Kairos can kind of shift their... their um, at least regulation application to support their defense in depth case because I oh mean, I'm there's, sorry there's... I'm sorry I completely misunderstood when you said defense I was thinking military defense not defense, defense of the reactor yes um there may be something there because that was that design was that was the one where I showed you the the balls being shot um that was their shielding design for that reactor and they sh they showed that they could make these just silly tough um, shields that, that could withstand essentially anything. Can you remind me of the, the name of that reactor? I don't think or there was aircraft, that reactor aircraft. You know, I will have to just send you the papers that that came from. I, I can't okay. think of a particular name. There was just a series of studies. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Hannah? Hello. Um, just kind of leading on from what Jerry spoke about with the solar um, aircraft that's been developed, we made contact with Dr. Bertrand Nicard from Solar Impulse Foundation. Um, they're responsible for the solar plane that flew all around the world um, a couple of years ago, I think 2016, it was solid in the news. Um, we spoke to him, thinking he's, he's all solar, he'll I'm not like nuclear, and he was maybe a bit resistant, but he had a really good conversation with the nuclear for climate volunteers. 
and he said, you know, he's interested in speaking to us and was, was open about nuclear. And his thing, so while it's called the Solar Impulse Foundation, it's not about just solar. So the foundation is to fund a thousand solutions and it, it's about efficiency, so it's efficient solutions. All of these things, you know, turning it from military into something commercial for the benefit of society that's, you know, civil use either for shipping, for aircraft, whether it's for a really fancy hotel in the sky, or whether it's for, you know, to replace really carbon intense, you know, international shipping, um, he would be somebody really good to reach out to. I think the question is, who can lead to that kind of conversation with him? Is there anybody already trying to develop this commercially in the civil nuclear space? I haven't seen anyone. Um, I would be very interested to know if anyone was trying to do it. I think it's a really interesting technology and, and, and kind of riffing off Charlene's question. I think one big thing to take away from this is to study some of the reactor designs and the ways they were thinking about protecting these reactors because they're just incredible. What they were trying to do forced Mm -hmm. the designers to think in a very different way. Uh, the famous example being the molten salt came out of it. But also, if you look at the Tori 2C, that homogenous reactor design, it has so little uranium in it. It is so responsive to load following, and it's so small. I look at that Mm -hmm. and immediately think micro reactor. I can't, I'm shocked no one's trying to make something like that for a mobile micro reactor for, um, you know, non-flying applications. Um, Might be kind of a you know crawl before you can walk like let's let's get the nuclear ocean platforms and let's get the nuclear ships going and then we can talk about planes after that um yeah yeah i just i wanted to add uh something to uh uh, what hannah was saying uh with solar impulse um uh so i actually had a chance to meet uh bertrand picard uh this this guy who um started this and, and and flew the plane uh at uh, clean tech forum and right before the pandemic. So I guess it was, I think it was like January, 2020, um, and got a chance to, uh, talk to him a little bit. Uh, and I had gone in with, I did, I did some research, uh, ahead of time, you know, following the, the building bridges, uh, protocol here. And I found out that his dad, uh, had actually, uh, gone on a, uh, submarine trip to the Mariana trench. Uh, in order to prove that there was life down there. And like, even that wouldn't be a suitable location for nuclear waste. <laughs> um, so his family had kind of this like epic, almost like heroic history, heroic anti-nuclear history, um, improving that there's no safe place for it. Uh, and so I, I went in with with that um, and uh, definitely uh, angled my my comments um, towards uh, recycling and towards the, uh, you know, the very, very stellar safety record of uh, spent fuel casks and, and everything. Um, and he did show some, some interest in uh, advanced reactors, though I think being selected as, as one of the, the Clean Tech 1000, or I forget the, the list of what, what they call their, um, uh, <laughs> the, their, their selections for their, um, their list. Um, but, uh, that, that might be a little bit of an uphill battle considering that his, his like father's legacy is sort of hinged on nuclear being dangerous. Uh, so just, just some background there. Um, but yeah. Thanks Garrett. Was so awesome. interesting. What was the submarine covered with? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't even know. They must be. It was probably Alvin, batteries. which is is batteries. That's batteries. there's there's like two submarines that have ever gone down the Marianas Trench, and they're both batteries. But there's always been talk that the Navy had a sub that probably could have done it, and you know they'll never tell you if they did do it. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so it does sound like the work that you did back in twenty twenty that that kind of the inception of the seed that nuclear is not all that bad, you know, um, seemed to, went the conversation for me and Raul spoke to him, and it yeah. was genuinely positive. So, right. um, and then he was really pleasant for the rest of the two weeks, you know, happy to say hello and stuff like that, walking by the booth. 
So I, I think that, yeah, uh, long, long game, we're, we're converting people over. For sure. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I hope so. Because I, I, I didn't really, uh, I didn't do a good job following up. Um, uh, and even though, I, you know, I got his contact and all that. So that, that was... Got it here. <sighs> nice. <laughs> it's I make sure you, you, you do it. Because it's been too long now for me. It's, you know, we're coming up mm -hmm. on three years. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But what... Yeah. what um, Charlene. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, I was just I was just saying goodbye to Charlene. She's got another meeting. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, go go on. Um, you, you mentioned that we really need Biden to stand up in Tennessee, and I, I think that's right as well. We, we talk about we would need commercial organizations. This is, is so risky, and Eric kind of talks about if we could get it, you know, um, in shipping first, then people might be more comfortable with it flying, and this is just several decades away in the future. Um, but if the if the countries, the nuclear countries get behind it and the governments get behind it, you know, you can already see that the funding only comes through military. So this is obviously financially, it requires an awful lot of support. So um, really, if it's good to move into the civil space, it really needs backing by Canada, States, United Kingdom, France, you know, nuclear countries. Um, whether that'll happen or not, I don't know. If they start taxing um, aviation fuel, um yeah yeah people may think about things differently if you start taxing aviation fuel and and you do bring up a good point that the the military um being interested uh can can be helpful not just in this in, in this technology but in kind of related things like the u.s military is currently funding nuclear rocket projects and the difference between a nuclear rocket and a nuclear jet engine is what you push into the reactor um the rocket takes hydrogen and the jet engine eats air um so there is you know, the, the technology is slowly creeping forward, even if it's not under the same name. So maybe, you know, may, maybe, uh, maybe when I'm an old man, I can ride on a nuclear powered uh, jet around the world. That would be cool. Cool. Well, I think we should end it there. We'll, we'll stay on time. Uh, and this was freaking awesome. So thanks Garrett for, for uh, sharing this.